it's really great because we get to participate one with another and we get to see some power couples. Uh, Brother Sheldon and Sister Crystal brought the uh, lesson on Wednesday night and Brother uh, Trey, or I should say Brother Tammy and Sister Trey, they kind of alternate, but they, they are diligent and they, they get right in that theme and bring us a word and it just lets us camp around a thought so that we all get on the same page. See, God commands the blessing on unity. And to be unified, you gotta, you got to know what you're being unified around. You've got to write the vision and make it plain so that he that reads it can run with it. There ain't no running if there ain't no reading. I know that's poor grammar. And on that note of poor grammar, I'm going to bring Sister Missy down here for a testimony. I'll say that kidding because she just cringes when she hears poor grammar. But I do it on purpose. Most of the time. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what. You got to talk to people in everyday language. You get your words too high blue and ain't nobody can understand what you're saying. Come on up here. You're too little. You're too little. All right. She's got a testimony. I do. But, but Andy has asked me to do a very, very difficult thing. Short. I, uh, yeah, you better pray over me, Andy. <laughs> yeah. Okay, here's the short version. I had cancer, breast cancer. I don't have it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now, in between times, there was a lot of praying by a lot of people, and I appreciate those people so much. I probably would not be standing here today, what, less than one week after my surgery, if people hadn't lifted me up. So thank you, thank you, thank you for all the prayers. I appreciate it. The, the God works in many ways. He doesn't just work by oh, miraculous touching. He works through medical people. And the Holy Spirit told me to pray for my surgeon. And she's a surgeon, and I'm just me. And I really didn't want to, but I had to. Because when, when God tells you something, if you don't, there's a terrible feeling. And so she talked her surgical talk, and I took her hand between my two hands, and I said, I want to pray for you. And I didn't know if she was Muslim or I didn't know anything. I just knew that I had to pray, so I prayed for her. And she held my hand for a long time. And she said, my mom prays for me three times a day. And she said, I pray twice a day. And I was just so grateful that my hands were going to be literally in his hands through her. I mean, it was just amazing. Oh, that's not all. The anesthesiologist came. And she started talking about God almost right away. So I, I prayed for her, too. I mean, it was just, this is MD Anderson, this ginormous cancer center. And God had lined up these medical people a long time ago for me. For me. And... They told me uh, when we left on Tuesday, they said it'll be two weeks before you hear about your pathology. But they called two evenings ago and they said there is no cancer in your lymph glands. There is no cancer surrounding the tissue of the tumor. And I mean, I, I felt so good. Only Jesus can do this. Only. I I've had. When I say no pain, I mean zero. And at first I thought, okay, they've like, I don't know, numbed things or I, I don't know, but no, none. The most I can say is that I've had some discomfort and who can't put up with discomfort? Yes, I, I will do that. Is that long? <laughs> this is causes trouble everywhere she goes. Anyway, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. 
It's Jesus. It's Jesus working through people. Your prayers. My doctor who found the lump and nobody at MD Anderson could feel it. Nobody. I, I, I cannot tell you how many people felt me up. I, I just <laughs> cannot. Oh, that's probably not. Oh, okay. Sorry. It, it, it's, it's disturbing. But none of them felt it. If they saw it on the, you know, they saw it on the machines and everything. But my PCP here in Longview, God used her because she found it and she started the process. So thank you, God. Thank you, God, for all these people. You did great, Missy. Let's give the Lord and Jesus and her a good praise. There you go. This is, that's a great segue into my sermon today. Because, see, when you walked into M.D. Anderson, Jesus walked in with you. And what could have been an atmosphere of death was turned into an atmosphere of life. And that's what I want to talk to you about just for a few minutes today, if you will allow me. I want to talk to you about changing the reality of the atmosphere. Uh, you are in an atmosphere right now. In fact, if we weren't in an atmosphere, we wouldn't be breathing. We wouldn't be tethered to the earth. We'd be floating around and, and suffocating. We're in an atmosphere. There's atmospheric pressure. How many have sometimes feel pressure in the atmosphere? How many sometimes feel a, a tenseness? You feel a density to the atmosphere. You, you, you walk into the room and there's a cold wave. Oh, it's quiet in here. You get home and you know your wife is in a snit. You know your husband's in a bad mood. You can feel it. <laughs> You're quiet on me today, but I'm going to preach anyway. I invite you to say amen for my guests. I'm more of a teacher than a preacher, so I really do invite everyone to take notes. Because it could just be that God is going to speak something to you direct that is for you, in particular, specifically for you. And it may not even be something I say, say uh, verbally. It may be something that God impresses on your heart. So if you have your notepad or even your phone out, no one will think you're playing, playing Angry Birds unless they know that you are. Unless you are. And so uh, I like to teach because I, I, I feel like when we come to church and we learn something, we go out a little bit higher, a little bit better. When you know better, you do better. Knowledge is power, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall do what? Make you free. What does truth do if you don't know it? Nothing. And so we, this is a, a teaching church, and we, we want to learn today. And I want to teach you about changing atmospheres, because the truth is, is there is a reality of an atmosphere. Even in our society, in our world, there's an atmosphere. You can tell there's a tenseness. There is a discord. There's a disunity. There's a striving. There's a strife. There's a, uh, there's a, a yucky, yucky feeling in politics on social media and a lot of it uh, there's there's there is enmity there's there's things going on to somebody hear what I'm talking about today there's just a a, 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 a a tenseness that's the only word I keep coming back to tenseness you hear it in the news media there's disagreement there's discord there's division and God doesn't command the blessing on division. He commands the blessing on unity. And we're the people of God. So we have to carry ourselves with a decorum and with a humility and with a power and authority that says, even if I walk into an atmosphere of tenseness, I'm going to change the atmosphere. I'm not going to be a thermometer. I'm going to be a thermostat. And I'm going to do what Jesus does, and I'm going to change the reality of the atmosphere. Do you realize that's why it says a kind word turns away, a soft answer turns away wrath. We're talking about changing atmospheres. And many of you all work in a tense atmosphere or your home life is tense or you have kids that are baby's children and they can't act right. I'm going to tell you, you walk into their room in the power of the authority of Christ when they're not there probably. And you pray on it. You stick a prayer cloth in their pillow. You talk in tongues. You do what Holy Ghost people do. And you change the atmosphere. Sometimes you have to pull down some posters. Sometimes you have to take some things out. Right? 
Am I talking to any parents of any teenagers here today? <laughs> That's right. This is my house. <laughs> and so if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn in them to Mark chapter 5. We're going to tell a very famous story of Jairus' daughter. I almost hesitate to preach from this passage because while we were at conference, we heard a masterpiece sermon on this story. And I'm not preaching that sermon. Okay. So just so you know, I didn't borrow this. This is... This is straight direct from this perspective. And isn't it neat how the Word of God feeds you? How the Word of God will feed you differently. Different. You'll take the same passage and it won't taste the same the next time. It'll do a little something different. Instead of working on your carburetor, it'll work on your muffler. Some of y'all need your muffler worked on. Because you're too noisy. Oh, Lord. All right, if you have it turned, I'm not going to have you stand because it's a lengthy reading, but we're going to begin reading at verse 21. Do you have it? Amen. Say amen. It says, Now when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great mul multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, that she, she may be healed and she will live. So Jesus went with them, and the great multitude followed him and thronged him. Move on down to verse 35, and it says, While he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher, the master, any further? And as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be afraid. Look at somebody and say, Do not be afraid. Only believe. And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw tumult, and those who wept and wailed loudly. When he came in, he said to them, Why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And when they ridiculed him, and they ridiculed him, but when he put them all outside, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him. You've got to know who's with you, amen. And he entered where the child was lying. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kumai, which is translated, Little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age, and they were overcome with amazement. Father, I ask that you let my tongue speak the pen of a ready writer. God, for those that are here today, they have come to hear a word from you about changing atmospheres. Lord, we are... Uh, life people. We are a life church. We've come to bring life, to speak life, to live life, abundant life. It's all about what you have come to do for us and do through us and work as us. Now, God, we ask as your ambassadors, as those that you have sent into the earth, as those that you've called, the, 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 you're king of kings, so we're those kings. You're the Lord of lords, so we're those lords. We're asking God that you cause us to walk into the authority that does, just doesn't discern what the atmosphere is, but determines what the atmosphere is by changing the reality of the atmosphere that we feel. Let it always be one that's higher, always be one that's more loving, always one that has more grace, always one that lifts and encourages. Let it be with the people of God. We ask it in Jesus' name. Everyone say, in Jesus' name. Come on, help me preach to say, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name we ask, amen and amen. Give the Lord a good hand praise for his word today. Amen. I want to paint the picture of this atmosphere because I imagine, Missy, that this child had been sick maybe for some time because she was to the point of death. That alludes to the uh, thought that she possibly was in a bad way for a while until she came to the point of death. And I'm going to tell you, when you get to the point of death, 
when you get to the point of, of there's nowhere else you could turn, there's only one place you could turn, and you can always turn to Jesus. You can always turn to God. Now, I invite you today to not do like Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, the pastor of Jerusalem first, To not wait to the last minute to go to God. To not let your phone call to God be a 911 call. Now, I will tell you, Joanne, that God will pick up the 911 call. In fact, we sang it in Pentecost for years. Call him up, call him up, and tell him what you want. But I invite you here today as Holy Ghost people, don't wait till the last minute to call on God. Because he said, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I want to call on him early in the morning because I know when I call on him, he will answer. Have I got anybody in the room? Now, I'm not trying to preach yet, but I want to get you a sense of this atmosphere because this atmosphere had been sad and bad for quite a while. Till it got to a breaking point, till it got to the, a tipping point where Jer said, I can't stay here. I've got to go where there's help. He probably didn't want to be there in case his daughter slipped into eternity, but there was something that compelled him. I've got to go get help for my daughter. He stayed and he nursed her and he was there and they were, they were all around trying to take care of this little 12 year old girl for as long as they could. But then he said, I got to go. I got to go get some help. Don't wait to the last minute to call on God. Call on him. In fact, have the Lord on speed dial. I remember when they started getting fancy with the phones. You know, you could do you, you could do do some different stuff with your phones. It, I'm old enough to remember that. It used to be that you just dialed seven numbers, and that's all I did. And sometimes there would be somebody else on the line. But then they st started doing things where you could call people back, and, and you, could, you could hit a speed dial. And, and, and so when they were singing Jesus on the main line, tell them what you want, they added a verse that said, You better star six to nine him, tell him what you want. <laughs> Have Jesus on speed now. Just be talking to him all day long. All day long I've been with Jesus. It has been a wonderful day. All day long, all day long I've been with the Master. All day long, all day yesterday I have my mind set upon Jesus. I want to tell you that I come to you today not empty, not with barely anything. i got a soul that's full of the good things of God that I am presenting here as a banqueting feast that you could pull up to the table and you could say yes Lord I'll have some more but I'm only telling you that because I invite you to be the kind of people that are in constant connection to the divine and so it is as he's got this atmosphere and so he goes to the one that can help and that brings us to our meditative thought we call this our spiritual homework to be practicing the meditative thought brings the word that you hear once on Sunday back to you Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. How many want to remember what God tells you? Some of you husbands can't even remember what your wife told you. I'm going to tell you what and your wife ain't going to like this, but what Jesus tells you is more important than what she said. Go ahead and forget the milk, but don't forget what God says. Today's meditative thought says, I believe God has raised Jesus to life and raised me into life and lordship with him. Life goes wherever I go, and when I walk in, the atmosphere must change to one of life. Travis, take out that wind. Must change to one of life. There at the end. I'll fix it so if you're taking a picture of it, you won't put my mistake there in that. The Bible says that he... Uh, how do you know that the spirits of God, it confesses that God has raised Jesus from the dead. This is a Jesus name, Jesus only church. We believe it's all and only about Jesus. Everybody say it's all about Jesus. It's all about, we would call ourselves in a theological term, Christocentric. It all centers around Jesus. In fact, it says, in Jesus, in Christ, dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. All came together in Christ. 
Everything that you need to know about God is represented in Jesus. And so Jesus, we know, came to die a vicarious death for us, to bear our sins on a cross, as Sister Laura so beautifully sang, my sins were nailed to a tree, and I bear them no more. You know, I love what Brother Trey, Trey said a few weeks ago in a Bible study. It really, I've been thinking about it. The commandment for forgiveness, if someone wrongs you, is to forgive them how many times? Seven times? Seventy times seven. And that's every day. Every day. You're supposed to forgive someone 490 times. Now, do you think, I'm asking a rhetorical question, that he's just saying when they get to 491, you don't do it? He's pretty much just telling you you have to forgive them every time, all the time, every day. Every time they do it, every time they say it, every time they act that way, you forgive them. You forgive them. But what Brother Trey said, I thought was so true, was that God won't have you apply a standard to someone else that you don't, always, you don't also apply to yourself. So that means that, D, you also forgive yourself 490 times a day. Because if God tells you to do it, you can rest assured that he's doing it. And if he's doing it and you're supposed to do it for someone else, why don't you go ahead and do it for yourself? Say amen. So he died this vicarious death for us. Our sins are on the tree. He remembers them no more. They are cast from the east is from the west. There is nothing blocking you from your blessing. The guilt and shame from what you did, what you said, how you acted is not in the heart or the mind of God. It only alienates from you, only alienates you from God because it's in your own mind. That's why we baptize. So you get your conscience clear. That baptism tank is not, that'd be a dirty tank if all the sins were left in it. But you come up with a clean and a clear conscience because you know when you forgive yourself, look at your neighbor and say, you need to forgive yourself. They're free of charge, not, not part of the sermon. But I want to talk about God raising Jesus to life because it wasn't all... See, people want to keep Jesus on that cross and they want to make it all about that cross. And I'm going to tell you, the cross is where it happened, but the cross is a done deal. The cross is a symbol of death. Say amen if it's all right. Look, I'm not against having a cross in the house. You see very few crosses around here. We'll have, we've got a few up. But we don't have them just all over the place. And there's a reason for that. Because we are not celebrating the death of Jesus. We're celebrating the life of Jesus. God raised Jesus from the dead. And he raised him to rule and reign. Somebody say amen. Now, so you need to understand this. When I say I believe God has raised Jesus to life and raised me into life as well, I believe that when God, everybody say when God, I'm not talking about when I got baptized. I'm not talking about when I said the sinner's prayer. I'm not talking about when I spoke in tongues. I'm talking about when God raised Jesus from the dead 2,000 years ago. He raised me before I got here. While I was a yet a sinner, Christ died for me. It was already a done deal. I wish somebody had put a hand up and say, I know that's right. And so he raised me into life and lordship. This is important because I give you the meditative thought just as God gives it to me. We will all say in this assembly today that Jesus is Lord. Amen? Look at somebody say, Jesus is Lord. Do you believe that he's Lord? I just believe that he's Lord. Come on, say it one more time because it feels good. Brother Richard Letourneau, Jesus is Lord. Now, it's easy to say, Ashley, but sometimes it's hard to put into practice. Because just because I say Jesus is Lord doesn't mean I'm making him Lord. What does it mean when I say Jesus is Lord or Jesus is my, my Lord? I'm subjecting myself to his Lordship. I'm saying to Jesus, Lord, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to be? 
I don't believe that you necessarily have to ask God, you know, every little thing. But I definitely believe in being led of the Lord. Every step. How you look, how you act, the words you use. I'm talking about changing atmospheres. I'm not moving off this, but, but you all have to understand the Lordship so that you can do it. See, I'm telling you who you are. Look at your name and say, you need to know who you are. So Jesus is Lord, but see, he's not just Lord by himself. He raised into life and lordship and raised us with him. The Bible says that we are seated together with him. He is the Lord of what? Lords. He is the Lord of King of Kings and Lord of... I'm not just talking about folks over there in England. Lord so-and-so. Lady so-and-so. I like how uh, Brother Kendricks calls the first lady of this church queen. Because, you know, she's all about royalty. And she likes all that, all that stuff, pomp and circumstance. And, and so uh, what if we started calling each other lords and ladies? Just to remind ourselves who we are in the kingdom of God. You're not some low class, white trash, on the other side of the tracks, got to reach up to scratch the bottom, paycheck to paycheck, barely making it. Lips so low, you're scooping up dirt. Nobody likes you. Everybody hates you. We should just eat some worms. <laughs> I've got to elevate you in knowledge today of your lordship with them. If Jesus is Lord, that means that you are Lord with them. That means you rule and reign with them. That means that you don't have to take any of the devil's guff. You can stand up and say, no, not here. No, not now. This atmosphere is going to change. I'm setting my thermostat. I'm dropping it to the temperature that I want it to be. And I'm determining... What he is. Isn't that good preaching? Say, because he's Lord. And this will be hard for somebody. Say, because he is Lord. I'm Lord too. I'm going to say it one more time. Because he's Lord. I'm Lord too. You got to get this today. You got to get it. Because if you don't know who you are, the devil will be riding with you. And the next thing you know, he'll be driving the car, taking you to the bad side of town, taking you to the drug house, taking you to the no-tell motel. Oh, Lord, it's quiet in here. Because he's Lord, I'm Lord. The devil may be doing, oh, no, not here today. The devil is as big or as small as you make him. Because he's Lord. I'm Lord. And wherever I go, life goes with me. When I walk into the atmosphere, everything brightens up. When I walk in, the party's about to happen. When I step through the door, it's going to get crunk. It's going to get lit. It's going to get turned. All right, I'll stretch some of you just as far as I could take you. I feel like it's about to snap. All right, tell somebody, say, I believe God has raised Jesus to life and raised me into life and lordship with him. Life goes wherever, wherever. I said wherever. I go, and when I walk in, I said, when I walk in, the atmosphere must change to one of life. Give the Lord a good praise. Come on, give him a good praise. I want to tell you four quick things today. You knew it was going to be four. There's four gospels, so hey, I got you four quick things. Four things that are going to help you change atmospheres. This is going to work in your home. This is going to work on your job. This is going to work in school. Brian, where are you? I'm missing, missing some of my teenagers. It's going to work 
wherever you are, this will work. But it won't work unless you understand that it'll work. It won't work unless you work it. The lamp is not going to give any light until you walk over and turn it on. Look at somebody and say, you got to turn it on. The first thing, number one, is you need to know this. It's no trouble to trouble God. It's no trouble to trouble God. Some of us are just a hot mess. Some of us are toe up from the flow up. Some of us need to check ourselves before we wreck ourselves. Needing to check up from the neck up. Some are just as crazy as a road lizard. Some are just a Jerry Springer show just waiting to happen. And look, I'm not even talking about those outside the church. I'm talking about right inside the church. <laughs> Sometimes it seems like the folks out of the church got a little more sense than the believers, than the saints. We got saints that ain't. We got Sunday saints and Monday ain't. <laughs> <laughs> we got some of y'all that lay your Holy Ghost down any minute that you feel like you need to if you, you speak in tongues one day and cuss somebody out the next look at your neighbor and say that's a hot mess but I'm going to tell you it's no trouble to trouble God it's no trouble to trouble your trouble is no trouble to God what am I saying today there's no problem that you can present to God that is going to cause him any grief or trouble I'm saying that God that sits high looks low I'm saying that God that sits high has the very hairs of your head numbered and knows your need before you even ask and he told us to ask that our joy might be full and he said you have not because you ask not put it into words it's no trouble to trouble God and this is so beautifully illustrated in this passage as Jairus is going to Jesus to save his daughter's life because she's to the point of death. He gets word that she's already died. She's already dead. It's already done. Why trouble God with it anymore? And Jesus so beautifully illustrates that it's no trouble to him. It's no trouble to him. Why? Why do we carry the load we were never designed in, in or destined to carry? Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer how many know that you have a friend in Jesus and that you have been raised to life and lordship with him and as an elevated state you can look down and you can see things clearly and when you can see things clearly you can present them clearly you know I love praying in the spirit because when I don't know how to pray I let the spirit pray through me and speak the perfect will of God into the atmosphere how many believe in this today amen will you say amen today but I'm gonna tell you that when your soul is troubled I was presented today with a prayer request before I came in the church I was picking up trash off the parking lot and someone said pastor pastor and came over and talked to me as somebody that hadn't been in a while and they couldn't be here today but they told me they said my son tried to kill himself. And then his daughter tried to kill herself. And then her granddaughter has honeycomb cancer. Just all eat up. So pray for my family. It's no trouble to trouble God. It's no trouble. I'm going to tell you, Missy, Brother Kendricks calls you handful. And everywhere you go, you're stirring up something. But your trouble is no trouble to God. And John, your trouble is no trouble to God. <laughs> Missy starts acting up. Just bring her to the Lord. You say, God, she's your daughter. You spank her. <laughs> she's not listening to me. Maybe she'll listen to you. 
And if we all understand that we've been raised to life and lordship with him, then we have Jesus as Lord over us. And because he's Lord, we'll listen to what he says. We'll do what he says. We'll go where he, he, he we will follow where he leads. We'll not only hear what he says and do it, we'll be led of the Spirit. I'm, I, I'm going to tell you, this is a Spirit-filled church. But more than being a Spirit-filled church, I'm going to tell you, I want to be a Spirit-led church. I want you to be filled with the Spirit because I believe in that. Look at your neighbor and say, it's important. The Bible says, be ye filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Jesus said, he commanded them to be filled with the Spirit. Amen. But why are we filled with the Spirit? We're filled with the Spirit's joy so we can be led of the Spirit. Amen. Led of the Spirit. And when we're led of the Spirit, we understand that this trouble is no trouble. God can handle that son, that granddaughter that have tried to kill themselves. There's a lot of mess medicines on the market that are messing with people's minds. We've heard a lot of this suicide stuff. I, want, I, I invite you, people of God, to understand that the enemy of our soul desires to steal, kill, and destroy. And it's up to the people of God to stand in the gap. It's no trouble to trouble God. Amen. Bring all your burdens to Him. Number two, the second thing that you do to be an atmosphere changer is you have to banish fear from thought. Banish fear from thought. Now, I, I'm going to say this on this one, and it kind of applies to the next point, too, that we're not going to right away. But I'm going to tell you that faith comes by hearing, and hearing from a Word of God. That could be, I, I really like it to say hearing, because I believe that your subconscious hears even when your conscious mind is not paying attention. And so if you, I invite you to do things like listen to the Bible while you're going to sleep. Or just have it on, playing in the background. Sometimes you can put it so low that you really don't hear it. But your subconscious mind is picking up everything in the atmosphere. Because of the law of vibration. Everybody say the law of vibration. I didn't intend to go here, but I'll go here for a second. The law of vibration says that everything in the universe is moving at a very slow pace. The chair that you're sitting in has molecules that are all moving. Everybody say it's all moving. And what causes it to move? Sound waves cause it to move. That's why it says, and God said, let there be light, and the lights came on. So it was created by vibration, God saying something and causing it to be. Now look, this is what the Genesis account is. We can take it literally, or you could say, well, if people say it was a big bang, don't you know if there's a big bang, God was the one banging it. God was the big bang. Look at somebody say, bang. <laughs> But everything was created by sound and sound waves. And so they cause influence over us. And, and you have to know that if faith comes by hearing, then so does fear. Fear comes not just by what you hear. And this is what I'm saying. That's the right word. But there's a better word that could be u utilized, especially with your conscious mind. Is you could say faith or fear come by listening or what you listen to. And so the man came and said, don't trouble the master anymore. Your daughter's dead. That's what he heard. That's what he listened to. Somebody who was on the scene, reporter from Channel 4 News, breaking news. Your daughter's dead. It's over. There's no need for all of them to come to the house because we, we've got something else going on with the house right now. Now it's time to sh shift gears and change things up. And Jesus' immediate response to what was heard by Jairus was, Do not fear. Do not be afraid. Banish the fear from your thought. Because the fear that goes into thought, I'm going to tell you, when you think about something, you'll end up doing what you think about. 
Your thoughts about something will influence what you do about it. If he had listened to the man instead of bringing Jesus to the house, hear me today, instead of bringing Jesus to the house to change the atmosphere from death to life, he would have went on home and called Welch's funeral home and got them involved and planned to grieve his, his daughter. Because of what he would hear, what he would think about, what he would get placed to. I'm going to tell you, I, I got a lot of senior saints. My precious, precious blue-haired, once-a-week blowouts. You ladies, you know, if you go to the once-a-week. My older people, Brother Trey. <laughs> Don't be having that news station on 24 hours a day. Don't be watching Fox News and CNN all day. I, I understand. Watch it maybe an hour. Get, they will repeat themselves every hour. If you, if you had it on for any time, you can get it in one hour. And then turn it off. They'll have you believing that China's fixing to evade America. They'll have you believing that your money's not going to be any good. You better run on the bank. They'll have you believing that there's not going to be enough food to eat. I'm going to tell you the devil is alive. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. Safety is of the Lord. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Every tongue that rises against me in judgment, I shall condemn, for this is a heritage of the Lord. I choose to believe the report of the Lord. Whose report are you going to believe? You listen to that mess all day. It's what you're hearing, and fear is going to come from what you hear. And then you're going to be thinking about it, and then you're going to be making decisions based not in faith, but in fear. Woo! Banish fear from your thought. What would you do? If you weren't afraid to do it. Somebody's planning the skydive. Yes, I speak. What would you do in business if you weren't afraid of failure? What would you do in a relationship if you weren't afraid of having your heart broken? What would you do for your children? If you weren't afraid that they wouldn't turn out, get on drugs, go the wrong way. What career choice would you make if you weren't afraid that it's not going to work out? I, I gave you a saying last week. Y'all remember what my saying was? Y'all been doing it? Do you remember? My saying. Everything's always working out for me. Look at somebody say, everything's always, I got to ride a $500 million roller coaster. You know why, Joanne? Because everything's always working out for me. What would you do if you weren't afraid? Banish fear once and for all. Do not fear. Do not fear. Do not fear. Let's say it. Do not fear. In fact, say it this way. I will not fear. I will not fear. I will not fear. Come on, say it. I will not fear. I will not fear. I will not fear. Only believe. Number three. The second, the third thing that we'll do to change atmospheres. Are y'all following where I'm going? Are you understanding who you are? Look at your next neighbor and say, I am Lord with them. I'm one of the Lords. I'm one, come on, say, I'm one of the Lords. <laughs> I'm one of the Lords. Come on, say, I'm one of the Lords. You don't have to be the Lord, but you have to be one of the Lord. Say, I'm one of the Lord. She did it. Everybody give Missy a hand. Sometimes she, she struggles to say it. She didn't want to say anything that's not right, and I understand that. But I want to get y'all, get y'all where we're going. We've got to be on the same page. Number three, the third thing that you do to change an atmosphere is silence the commotion. I like what Brother Trey would say. Sometimes he'd say, uh, shut down the racket. Turn that rock and roll music down. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, when I'm talking about silencing the commotion, I'm talking about ascertaining in your own life what is racket, what is noise, what is something going on that is not benefiting you and your own soul and benefiting the atmosphere around you. 
So Jesus gets to the house, and I like that he only takes three of his disciples because you realize that even though we're all disciples of God, God can't count on all of us all the time because some of us are slip sliding away. Some of us are shifty. Some of us are 50-50. Some of us are some days in and some days out. You're playing the hokey-pokey with God. You put your whole self in and take your whole self out. I'm not talking to anybody here because all y'all are super saints. But I'm speaking to someone online that's got one toe on the line and the rest of their body is rearing back to perdition. Oh, Lord, it's quiet in here. <laughs> It's like Sodom. It says Sodom pitched his tent towards Sodom. And next time you hear about, I mean, a lot, Lot said, it said Lot pitched his tent towards Sodom. Next time you hear about Lot, he's not pitched his tent toward it. He's living inside the city. He's one of the mayors. He's on the city council. It's quiet in this house. <laughs> so I'm talking about this because when Jesus took his three disciples, Peter, James, and John, his favorite, and he gets to the house. There's commotion going on because in that day and that time they would actually hire people to come and weep and wail at the house of Jairus to show homage, pay homage to how much the soul that's departed was loved. And the more racket you could get, the more of an indication it was that the family put forth an effort. It would be the same thing as, as us really putting on the dog for a funeral. I mean. We get everybody involved, and maybe if, you, if you're a celebrity, you have three or four funerals and three or four cities, and everybody. They said the queen, when the queen passed, that there was like a mile, about five miles long, people were waiting to come. Hey, I'm so, so this kind of thought in that day, they, they had all these people that were weeping and wailing, and the truth was, is they didn't, a lot of them didn't even know the child. They were just paid to come and make a commotion. And I'm going to tell you that there's people paid by the devil to come into your life and bring a commotion and bring a nonsense and bring a trifling spirit and bring a vexation to your soul and you got to know that when they come and they're bringing all that mess that you have the power and the authority and the lordship of Christ because you're ruling reign with him to say shut up devil I ain't listening to you today <laughs> and so Jesus says why are you all weeping and wailing she's not sleeping I mean she's not dead she's just asleep because Jesus knew as Lord, and you got to know this as Lord, I'm Lord with him, that just like he calls things that be not as though they already were, that's what I do. Look at your neighbor and say, that's what I'm doing. I'm changing the atmosphere. I'm calling things that aren't as though they already were, already have been, already. And this is, he can do this because he sits outside of time. He sees the end from the beginning. He's the alpha and the mega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Amen. And if he's that, we are that with him. You've got to understand what it says about Jesus. It says about you. When I say about your Bible, say my Bible is a book about me. Tell somebody, say my Bible is a book about me. Amen. And so he silences the commotion. And they turn from weeping and wailing. This, this shows you how disconnected they were from this child and really caring about her passing. They go to ridiculing the man that says she's not dead. They stop crying just like that. I'm going to tell you that the people that cry and pitch a fit and, and, and pitch a walleye fit in your life because they don't get their way, they'll stop it in a New York second when you stop putting up with it. When you stop entertaining it. When you don't give them a listening ear to their mess, they'll either go somewhere else that someone else will listen to it, or they'll shut it up, and that'll be the best thing for them. You all know what the word, uh, when, when we uh, enable somebody, enablement, you enable bad behavior, we say what you tolerate, you perpetuate. Some of you got grown children keep coming to you for money. They're going to keep on coming as long as you give them the money. That was for somebody I don't even know who. I don't even want to know. It's quiet. It's say amen or owe me one. I'm going to tell you, whatever it is, whatever it is, when there's commotion going on in your life, you can't hear the pure stream of God coming into your own consciousness. It will block the voice of the Lord. 
He speaks in the still small voice. It showed up in the in the life of the prophet when there was an earthquake, when there was a fire, when there was a wind. The Lord wasn't in, in any of that commotion. And a lot of the commotion you have in your life, you have got commotion in your life because you're bored, because you don't have anything in lordship, because, because you are just entertaining the racket that's around you. Some of you all enjoy drama. I'm going to tell you, if I'm going to sit down and watch a movie, I would rather watch a comedy than watch a tear-jerking drama. That's just me. We all know I like Hallmark movies. Because you don't even have to watch a Hallmark movie and you know it's going to turn out good. And there's really only about two or three storylines. So you don't have to pay attention to it. You know somebody's going to move from the big city to the small town. They're going to fall in love, right? Back in love. Reignite a love. Someone did leave and they come back. Boom, the flame turns on. And then you know what's going to happen? There's going to be a problem. There's going to be a commotion. There's going to be a situation. They're going to hear somebody said something. They're going to cry a little bit. But you don't even have to watch it. I'm going to tell you, you don't even have to watch it. Because 10 minutes before the movie is over, they're going to work it out. I'm going to tell you, that might be where you are in your life. Maybe it's 10 minutes before it's about to be worked out. Don't give up on it. Let your life be a hallmark movie. Say, work it out, Jesus. Any way you bless me, I'll be satisfied. I'm about to stop all this drama and all this nonsense and entertaining commotion in my life when I know that you speak in the still, small voice. This is free of charge, and I'm moving to the last one, and we're going quick. I invite you, I'm teaching today, to start your day silencing the commotion. Don't start your day in a racket. Don't start your day yelling at your wife that she burnt your toast and scorched your shirt. I think I'm going back to the 1950s, aren't I? She don't make you no toast. You make your own toast. Get a dang pop tart. <laughs> Oh, how many of us married folks sometimes wake up on the wrong side of the bed and the first one to catch it is the one you love the most? Start your day in peace. Start your day in quietness of soul. I tell you, before I get out of bed, brother, what I try to do is I try to thank God for at least ten things. At least ten things to be thankful for. Because I know gratitude is the highest vibration I can offer unto God. When I get into that place of vibrating and gratitude, it's the next thing to being conscious with God, being one with God. So I just begin thanking Him. Can we do that for a few minutes? I'm going to teach you. Come on, just begin thanking Him. Thank Him for your church. Thank Him for your pastor. He's pretty good. He dressed pretty sharp today, too, if I do say so myself. I, I, I took care of picking up this tie. I let the Lordship of Christ come in me when I picked up this tie. I was going to put on a black tie, but I said, I don't know if black tie goes with the Lordship of Christ with this navy coat. So I let the Lord lead me. Thank God for a pastor that's led of the Spirit. Thank God for a church that you can go to that you can be free to worship God. Thank God for a country that we're not being pulled in by the, uh, the enemy to arrest us. Thank God for your family. Thank God for your spouse. Thank God for your children. Thank God for the roof over your head. Thank God. I tell you, I do it before I get out of bed. I thank God for my comfortable king-size bed. We had a queen-size bed for a long time. I'm going to tell you, we were moving on up. We got that king-size. After we got rid of the kids, we got the king-size bed. While we had the queen-size bed, they wanted to be in it with us. Oh, I thank God for the emptiness. I thank God. <laughs> I thank God. I'm so grateful. Come on, get it. I want you to just begin thanking the Lord. I want to hear you do it. I'm just so grateful, Lord. I'm so thankful for my salvation. I'm thankful that I have life and peace. I'm so thankful that you healed Missy of cancer. I'm so thankful that you touched John's heart. I'm so thankful that you brought Brother Kendrick's back to church. I'm so thankful for your business prospering, Jasmine, your school prospering. I'm so thankful, Sheldon, that you're going 
going to be healed and that your back is going to be well and you're going to walk straight and you're going to feel good. I'm so thankful for Trey. He's such a help. He's such a loyal friend. I'm so thankful for Jerry Longmire. He's been a help in this place. I'm so thankful for Ingrid. I'm so thankful. Come on, begin to thank God for one another. Begin to thank God for the little things, the clothes on your back, the shoes on your feet, the food that you eat, the place that you sleep. I'm slipping into rhyme. I'm going to stop before I start rapping. Number four, do that before you get up. Do that before you get up. Bring Jesus in with you. Put everything else out. Bring Jesus in with you. So he puts, he, he, he comes into the house. Jairus comes into the house, but he doesn't come in alone. He brings God in with him. You need to understand that when you show up, it's not just you showing up. It's God in you showing up as you. What do I say? You are the only Jesus some will ever see, the only Bible some will ever read, and the only church some will ever go to. Look at your neighbor and say, you are. Now say, I am. We're talking about the Lordship of Christ. If he's Lord, I'm Lord with him. I'm seated together with him. And so wherever I go, I bring Jesus in with me. This goes back to our meditative thought. When God goes in, when I come in, Things about to change. Y'all know I love the movie Color Purple. And I like when Miss Seely starts going, or actually it's, it's, uh, it's Oprah Winfrey. I forget her name in the movie. She says, things changing around here. Things going to be changing around here. She'd been put in prison. She'd been beat up. But she changed her mind. And when she changed her mind, she changed her words. And when she changed her words, she changed her atmosphere. And when she changed her atmosphere, her life changed. Do you see how it works? Do you see how it works? But you've got to bring Jesus in with you. But it's not just important to bring him in with you. He had to put everybody else outside the house. Because everybody weeping and wailing and ridiculing were going to hinder the miracle. I'm going to tell you that not everybody's going to be your fan of your success. Not everybody's going to rejoice when God blesses you the way that He wants to bless you. And you would think, and sometimes it's sad because you'd think it's family members sometimes that just don't, you know, are jealous. They don't like it that you dress nicer you lost weight, or you got a good-looking husband, or uh, you, you're in a successful relationship, or you got that promotion, or you're driving a nice car. I'm not talking to anybody. I'm not just talking to the Internet. Because all your family loves you. All y'all have perfect family. Y'all don't have nobody in, your, in jail in your family. You don't have anybody that's a hot mess. You don't have anybody that's acting up. No, not y'all. I have found that every family has a black sheep. Every family's got somebody that when they come to the house, you better put your purse up. Stick your fingers. Stuff goes to missing. Oh, Lord. Folks that just can't act right, can't do right, can't seem to do right. And they want to get jealous because you've discovered the Lordship of Christ. His lordship over you and your lordship in him. See, it has to be both. Because God is not going to do for you. Listen to me today. Holiness people, listen to me. God is not going to do for you what he expects you to do for yourself. God is not going to do for you what he expects you to do do for yourself. A lot of you have small children. You do a lot more for small children than you do older children. When they're old enough, they need to be clean in their own room. Mm -hmm. You see how God is a master and he's a father and he, he's a wise God. And you can't be a better parent than God. He is our father. So when Jesus showed this by example to change an atmosphere, 
Sometimes you have to extract to get some things out. Uh, we sang the song, Cast Out Demons. <laughs> some people cast out demons when there aren't even demons there. You cast out your own demons. You end up casting yourself out because you are your own devil. And you say, devil, get out of here. And you end up getting, you pick up your person, you're going out. You cast yourself out. But I'm going to tell you, there is a time to get rid of everything and anything, everyone and anyone that hinders your miracle. How could two walk together unless they be agreed? I'm going to tell you, in the course of this church, we see people come and we see people go. But if they come and they, they, their heart doesn't get linked up and lined up with the word, with where we are, as much as we love them, we have to let them go. Because we're an atmosphere changer. We're not just a therm thermometer. We're a thermostat. We're changing the atmosphere of South Longview. And everything around us is going to be elevated because of the Word of God that's spoken in this place because of the praise and the prayers that go up because of the fellowship and the love that's in this house. We're not going to tolerate anybody coming in and bringing any kind of divisiveness, any kind of racist or, or, uh, or uh, misogynist, you know, any kind of any, anything that just has that, that feel of dis-ease to it. It's not going to work here. Because we're subjected to the Lordship of Christ. And we rule and reign with Him. Now, I'm going to close with this. And Brother Travis, I'm going to get you to give me uh, some soft music. If you would, please, son. Thank you. We've got Travis on the platform singing today. Wasn't that something? I love it. I love it. Hallelujah. Just quiet our hearts and our minds just for a moment. When we think about the Lordship of Christ and ruling and reigning with Him, some, some of us have this as a future event. Post-millennial, one day my prince will come somewhere over the rainbow. We used to sing about heaven, and I love heaven. I know I'm going to heaven when I, when I die. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I fly away. But life can't be all about our eternal resting place. God has designed and destined us to bring heaven to earth. The kingdom of heaven is within us. And God's desire is for us to bring what's inside to the outside. Now the truth is, is we're all doing that whether we believe we are or know we are or not. As you're listening in this soft, malleable state, what's showing up around us in form is a product of our thoughts, product of our actions, product of our words. Some of us don't want to own it. Some of us don't like it. But the truth is, is that you are the architect of your life. And what is showing up is a product of your faith or your fear. It works in the positive, but it also works in the negative. And if you don't like what you have going on in your life, Physically, relationally, financially, spiritually, materially, in any arena of your life. If you don't like it, only you can change the reality of your atmosphere. Only you can put everything else out. Only you can silence the commotion. Amen. Amen. Only you can banish fear from your thoughts. Only you can decide it's no trouble to trouble God. Only you can cast your burdens. I say this on a regular basis. I can pray for you, but I can't do your praying. I have a word for you every week, but I'm going to tell you, if you only eat once a week, you're going to starve. 
If you only eat spiritually once a week, you're going to spiritually starve. You've got to be a self-feeder. You've got to get something that feeds your soul. I mean, don't be afraid of listening to something that's well, but maybe that's false doctrine. Maybe this. God will give you a spirit in you that will know to reject what's not right. And sometimes you have to hear three things that aren't right for the one thing that you needed for your own soul. See, God used the blackbirds to feed the prophet Elijah. He used the dirty bird to sustain him. And I'm going to tell you, sometimes you could just be watching SpongeBob SquarePants and Spirit of the Lord, just drop a little word in your soul from SpongeBob. I'm being a little facetious, but just a little, because this is how much I believe that God uses everything to connect to his subjects. The kingdom of God. And I say the kingdom of God. Jesus is king. And Jesus is Lord. And he's raised me to rule and reign with him. Now, what was I saying about someday I'll do that? If the kingdom is yet to come, and it is coming, but it's only yet to come, then we're probably all in trouble. But if the kingdom is truly within us, that means it's in the present tense right now. When we say your presence is heaven to me, I can step into a heavenly place with God at any time. I've already been seated together with him in this heavenly place. And when I say he's the Lord of lords, I'm talking about me. When I'm talking about the Bible, I'm reading a book about me. What I believe it says about Jesus, it says about me. What I believe when it says Moses was told that the name of God, forever name of God is I am, that God gave himself a name, referred to himself, and something that you can't say without also referring to yourself. I am. When I say I am, I'm talking about God. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm talking about God. But I'm also talking about me. And what does he say? He is whatever he attaches that, to that. He is, I am Jehovah Rapha, the Lord your healer. I am Jehovah Jireh, the Lord your provider. And so the truth is, is that whatever you attach to I am becomes true for you. And if you say, I'm sick, I'm disgusted, busted, can't be trusted, then all that becomes true. But if you'll do like the Bible says, let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. See, I'm not just reporting on what is. I'm declaring what will be. Father, I've delivered my soul this word, and I've went longer than I intended to. But I'm asking God that you would so impart this word into everyone that they would go out of this house knowing exactly who they are. And if you have a need in this house, I want you to put your hand up behind and say, I have a need. Father, I see the needs and I know that you see the needs. And God, I know that you these needs mean, mean more to you than they ever could to anyone here. And I'm asking God with everything within me, as I bring the trouble to you, I know it's no trouble to trouble you. And I'm asking, Lord, as we present and cast our cares upon you, God, that you come with us into the situation, that you silence the racket, silence the commotion, and put everything else out that delays and denies your miracle work and power from working in us, through us, as us. And Lord, as you say, daughter, arise. Little daughter, arise. I say to every need here today, let it happen. Let it happen. Let it happen just as requested. In the sweet and righteous and holy name of Jesus. Will you stand to your feet? Just kind of cut that uh, piano for a second. We're going to sing acapulco for a second. It is well. With my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul, it is well. Tell somebody. With my soul, you sound beautiful. Oh, yes, it is well, it is well with my soul, 
give the Lord the best praise that you know how. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You're our guest here today. Thank you so much once again for being at Life Church. We want you here every week. Go in the love and the favor of God. My wife and I will be on a trip this week, and we will not be available by our cell phones. So if you need to get a hold of me, you can do it by my email, or you can do it by messenger. So I just want you all to know that. And if you will be praying for traveling mercies over us, we appreciate it in Jesus' name. God bless every single one of you. Go in the favor of God today.